Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So I'm Karina, I'm a UX researcher, which basically means that companies pay me to listen to people. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, and I'm gonna talk about a few nitty-gritty methods things that will help you out if you're a researcher too. But before I get into that, I wanna give you a little bit of background on where I come from, because I think it's really helpful in terms of understanding how I approach research today. So this is where I've lived. Oh goodness, you can't see this at all. It's, there, there's a world behind there. <laughs> I promise, it's gray on gray and it's really lit, so it's, it's really hard to see. But I've lived in South America, Asia, five places in the US, I've lived in eight countries. I'm probably one of the only Uruguayans you're ever gonna meet. <laughs> and um, this has really informed how I approach my work today because I've been listening to people from a really young age. And if research is just about listening, then I've had a lot of practice. So I've been living in a lot of countries where I didn't even know the language for you know, the first year or two. I was living somewhere and I couldn't talk. So I just had to spend the first year listening to understand the grammar, the words, the social cues, like what's okay to say, what's not okay to say. And that practice has been really, really helpful professionally. So after I had this experience growing up and living all over the world, I went to Bowdoin College, small school in Maine, in the United States. And I studied anthropology. I was like, if there's one thing I know, it's human culture. I'm gonna go study that. So I went and I got a degree, basically, in listening. Uh, I really, really like this quote. This is Ernest Hemingway. He says, when people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. So after my upbringing living in eight countries and after getting a degree in anthropology, I had this, like, good practical foundation from having lived abroad, and I had this academic foundation from having gone to school and, and learned a little bit more about research methods from a qualitative perspective there. And I've come to the conclusion that research is just really two things. It's just finding the right people to listen to, and then like Ernest Hemingway says, just listening to them completely. If you just do that, <laughs> you'll, you'll go a long way in your career. So I graduated from college and I decided that I wanted to apply all of these things I'd learned to the tech industry. So I showed up in Silicon Valley, bright eyed and fresh faced, and I was like, we're gonna go solve the user experiences in tech by understanding people. So I work at Lyft, that little um, company in the balloon over there. I've also worked at Twitter. And what I wanna talk about today is some work that I did last summer when I was working for a company called Foursquare. So in case you're not familiar, Foursquare is a location-based app and they have two products, Foursquare and Swarm. Foursquare is an app that gives you recommendations on places to go. It tells you based on your interests and where your friends have been, um, like what types of places you might want to try, which places are new. So bars, restaurants, cafes, that type of thing. And then Swarm is an app that launched in 2014 while I was working there, which was their newer app, which was a way to check in and share where you are right now. So you could actually share with your friends and say, I'm here, um, and then potentially meet up with them. And it's, it's more of a social app. So I was working for the company. The company started in 2009. Um, I think I started working there in like 2012. And then uh, Swarm launched in 2014. And shortly after Swarm launched, we noticed that we were getting just tons of usage in Turkey. Um, so Foursquare had always been really popular in Turkey. The app like, always had a lot of users there, and we knew that we were getting a lot of traffic from Turkey. And then when Swarm <laughs> launched, we noticed that that app in particular was really taking off there. And we had tons of usage data, so we knew what people were doing on the, the product. We knew that not only were we getting a lot of traffic, but that the traffic looked a little different from traffic in the US. The friend graphs were a little denser. There were, there were people who were like taking advantage of different features that weren't really as widely used in the United States. So there's a lot of traffic and it also didn't look quite familiar to us. And then we also had some employees at the company who were from Turkey who could give us some perspective on what their friends were doing. And periodically, people who worked at the company would go to Turkey to speak at a conference or something. And that would, like, they'd, then they'd bring back insight and say, you know, based on what I've heard, these are some of the things that are going on. But we hadn't done any like, deep qualitative research to sort of like, put a framework around it and try to understand with some academic rigor what was actually going on on the ground. So that was some background in the last summer, so I want to say it was like June or July of 2015. And the executive team came to me and they're like, Karina, what is going on in Turkey? Help. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot answer that question. That is a very big question. 
um, I was like, we're gonna have to get a little bit more specific here. So I tried to figure out like what they actually wanted to learn to see if we could narrow their questions a little bit. Because typically when I'm starting out a project, there's a lot of back and forth with my stakeholders about um, how I can be most helpful, how I can make sure I'm talking to the right people. And it turned out that like, they really didn't have more specific questions. So what they were lacking was that general foundation. So they're like, in the future, we need to know what's happening. We need, we need to understand the context. So we decided that there just really wasn't a more specific question. Um, it was just my job as a researcher to go to Turkey and to just try to see as much as I could learn to sort of provide that foundation for the future, to provide that context so that for anything that happened in the future, if there was a change in usage patterns or if a new product launched and it was um, used in a very different way, that we had an understanding of why that was happening. So instead of narrowing things down based on the research question, we narrowed it down um, based on some logistical constraints. So I had eight weeks to do the research and $20,000. And if you're a UX researcher, this is kind of an insane time frame and budget to do an international research project. I was like, oh, oh my god, how am I going to tackle this? So um, I, I wanted to get creative. I wanted to think about like, what was the most value I could provide to the company given these constraints. And I'm really glad that Lola, um, in the last talk, started to break down this dichotomy between qual and quant. because. This is something I've been thinking about a lot as a qualitative researcher, like what does qual mean and how can I be useful and how does it complement quant? And over the years I've started to think about qual and quant as like much less of a binary, it's much less one or the other and it's much more of a spectrum. So when I was tackling this project and I was thinking about how to get things done within this time frame, I went back to the spectrum of qual to quant methods that I usually think about when I'm tackling a project to see which methods made the most sense for these particular questions that I had. So I'll spend a minute talking about um, what the spectrum means to me. So at the top we have the more qualitative methods where you're talking to fewer people and you're spending more time per person. Um, I know that this is a little hard to read, I'm sorry. Um, so at the top we have field studies where you're spending the most time per person, so you're really, um, taking the time to travel, like maybe go to their homes, you're gonna spend like maybe several hours with someone. Uh, so you can't do a ton of them. You have to be pretty picky about who you talk to for a field study and you can't um, go interview everyone within your user base with this method. Then after that we have lab studies where you're asking people to come in so you can do a few more because you don't have the travel time involved with that. Then you have diary studies where you can talk to a few more people still because if you're asking people to diary their experiences over a certain period of time, you can send it out to you know, maybe 40 people or you know, up to 100 and ask them to um, create videos or send screenshots or describe their experiences, but you're still gonna get a ton of data back so you can't do that with everyone. Then you have surveys. Um, thanks to rating scales, you can um, get value from a lot more people with this method because when more people fill it out, you get better quality results in your, in your surveys. And then finally, you have usage data where you're just literally seeing what everyone on your platform is doing with your service. So um, I see value on this entire spectrum. There's not one side that's better, there's not one side that's worse. And usually when I'm choosing my methods, I pick a combination rather than just one because at the top you're getting the depth. You're like really going deep with a few people and you're really understanding their context. And at the bottom you're getting the breadth. But if you're tackling a new area, you actually need depth and breadth. You can't really just pick one direction to go in. So usually when I'm picking, um, when I'm starting a new project, I'll pick a couple of methods. These are the ones that I use the most often. There are other UX research methods I'm not including here, of course. But I found in my career, these are sort of the ones that I always come back to and use all the time. And at this point in the planning stage, I decided I needed help. Like, I had never tackled an international research project on the skill before, so I went to my friend Gabe, who's um, the head of research at Pinterest, and he's done a lot of international research, and I was like, okay, Gabe, I have these constraints, I have you know, these methods in my toolkit, I have to go understand this country, like what do you know about it? And he was really helpful in terms of talking about some things that had or hadn't worked for him with his projects. And through that conversation and through a bunch of planning on my own, we came up with um, choosing these methods to study uh, for this particular project in Turkey. So we did field studies, lab studies, 
a survey, and then usage data, which I'm not going to talk about because we already had been collecting a lot of it and it wasn't my job to go collect it. But I am mentioning it here because you should definitely be friends in your company with the people who are collecting your data. And you should always be looking at it when you're planning your projects because that will inform what questions you should be asking, where you need to go deep. So this was a part that had already been going on within the company, but I was taking a lot of advantage of it during this planning process. So we ended up doing one survey, 12 lab studies, and four field studies. And of course, for the last two methods, we actually had to go to Istanbul. So I went to Turkey to do those. But before going to Turkey, I tackled the survey. And there's a few reasons why I wanted to do this method first. Um, first of all, it was the cheapest one to run. So I could actually get started with it while I was still getting budget approval for some of the more expensive pieces along the way. Um, but also because it's, a survey is a really great method to use while you're in the planning stages for other research because you can collect the data and work on it in little moments within the day. So you can come in, um, like reorder some questions, do some wordsmithing, and then you can like switch gears completely and work with a different team. Or you can start writing your interview guide for your lab sessions. So it's a really flexible method that you can use in parallel with other things. The really nice thing about this particular survey is we'd previously um, run a general satisfaction survey with Swarm in the United States. So I was like, how convenient. I've already written my survey. I just need to translate it into Turkish. So I could skip all of the um, phases I usually go to in writing a survey where I have to talk to my stakeholders and figure out which questions to ask and how we want to word them. I was just like, the survey's already written. Because um, luckily, I had created a really general um, reusable survey that I could uh, rerun in different markets or rerun in the United States over different years and benchmark and see how things were changing. I, all I had to do was send it to a translator and pay them and get the responses back. And then, of course, you have to budget an extra time if you're doing international research because if you have open-ended responses, you have to translate them back into English or you can't understand what people have told you. Um, so I was running those along the way. And we learned a couple of really interesting things through running this survey. And it was really important that we did this survey before we went on the ground in Turkey because it informed the questions that we wanted to ask on the ground. So we heard some really interesting concerns about um, privacy and some ways that men and women were filling out the survey differently. There were some men who were filling out the survey who said that Swarm gave them great opportunities to meet new people and expand their social network, and they were like really, really happy that they had these new ways to connect with people. And then there were a few women who were filling out the survey who were like, yeah, kind of want a little bit more control over who can message me. So we knew that gender was going to be a factor. So we went um, on the ground in Turkey. We, we knew that we would need to talk to an even gender mix. We need to pay attention to that on the ground. And then we went to Turkey. Um, I highly recommend going. It was such a blast. And if you can get um, people who are using a restaurant and bar discovery app to show you around, you're going to have an even better time. Because we had locals the whole time showing us around Istanbul, which was a blast. So we ran these 12 lab studies with an agency called UTR Lab. They were phenomenal. They helped us out a lot. And um, they were uh, doing the moderation and the recruiting. They really helped us stay within this really tight time frame that we'd assigned, which was eight weeks, by taking a lot of the work off of our plates. And they were conducting the sessions in Turkish. So we knew when we were going to go on the ground in, in Turkey that we would need some help with translation. And we didn't just stop there. We actually hired a full research agency who could not only do the translation, but also moderate the sessions for us. And we had simultaneous translation in the back room, so we could hear in English what was happening during the sessions, and we could collaborate with the moderator and give her direction and hear what she was noticing and paying attention to during the sessions. So it was really a joint effort. And this goes back to um, what I was talking about at the beginning, where research is really about finding the right people to listen to and then listening to them completely, because we spent a lot of time thinking about who we wanted to listen to when we did these lab sessions. And we decided that the most important thing was to listen to people who were actively using Swarm, uh, which was the app that was really, really popular in, in Turkey, um, but who weren't super active. Like, we didn't want to talk to the people who were 
super loyal, always going to stick with us. We wanted to talk to the people who are using it in a normal way, where they were using it in conjunction with other apps, um, to get a, a pretty good picture of what was representative on the ground. And we could actually watch people using the, um, our apps through these lab sessions. So we were sitting in the back room, and we had picture in picture, and we could watch the participants' faces and see what they were doing. And not only could we watch what they were doing on our app, but we also asked them to give us a tour of their phone and to show us what other apps they were using and how they were using them. So we understood how Swarm was fitting in with this overall landscape of tech usage in Turkey, which looks really different from tech usage in the United States. And here, what we learned was that there was some confusion among these people about um, Foursquare and Swarm being separate services. So we'd launched Swarm. We already had this app called Foursquare. And there was um, pretty extensive messaging in the United States about why that change happened and uh, what people could expect from Swarm. And a lot of that messaging just hadn't really reached Turkey. Um, and so people were getting information from their friends. Uh, it was a really important product for people there. So there was a lot of like, hey, what do you think is going on? And um, there was some like, concerns and doubts that we didn't hear in the United States. So this was really important for helping us understand that when we're thinking about communicating our products, we had to be more aware of an international audience. And the other thing that we learned through these lab sessions that was so interesting was that people had a really different usage of photos on Swarm and Foursquare in Turkey than they did in the United States. So people were looking at their own photos and their friends' photos, and they were really aware of photo privacy. Um, so who could see what and what they were sharing. And this was a really important part of their identity. Like their Swarm profile was, was really important for showing who they were. And that was not something that we'd heard a lot in the United States. So having that data stream in conjunction with a survey was starting to, to paint a broader picture of what was actually happening in Turkey. And to round it out, we did four field studies. So we decided to do these because if we were going to be in Turkey anyway, if we were going to be on the ground, we should take advantage of the fact that Swarm and Foursquare are location-based products. We should see how they're actually being used in locations. We needed to go to the venues where people were checking in on Swarm and where people were using Foursquare to find what was good to eat. And we needed to use the product in those spaces too to say, like, is this the experience we want to deliver? How is it similar to the United States? How is it different? And how are the people that we're building for experiencing those differences? So here we decided to talk to our most active users. So this was half research and half community management. We wanted to talk to the people who were keeping our venue data up to date, the people who were spending all this time to, to curate what we were putting out there. Foursquare calls them super users. So we recruited four super users, and I had conversations with them before going to Turkey about what our goals were and what we wanted to learn. And we did all of the planning together. So I involved them in figuring out what would be most helpful and got a lot of their feedback on which neighborhoods we should go to and how to structure the sessions. Uh, here are two of the super users who we met with in a coffee shop in Istanbul showing off the stickers that we gave at the end of the session. They were really excited to have them. <laughs> And we picked four neighborhoods in Istanbul to do these field studies in. So one field study per neighborhood. And we picked these neighborhoods because we wanted places in Istanbul where locals go out. And we wanted four neighborhoods that were really different from each other. So we wanted to hear from people in different neighborhoods like where they were going and how they were picking those places and how Swarm and Foursquare fit into their experience of going to those places. Um, so Bebek is kind of like a more upscale, um, kind of like, like almost yuppie neighborhood with like a couple of like walking streets with like nice restaurants and cafes, some really pretty parks. It's a really nice place to just like walk around and spend an afternoon, but a lot of tourists don't go there. Um, Kadikoy was on the Asian side, so it had a very, really different feeling because of that. In, in Turkey, in Istanbul, you have the Asian side and the European side, and there's like a lot of cultural differences, and you can really feel that in getting around the city because there's also this geographic divide. Uh, and then Taksim and Chihangar were two popular going out neighborhoods on the um, European side. Chihangar was reminded me a lot of San Francisco where I live because it had all of these like these hills and then these little like cafes and restaurants that were sort of like tucked between these hills. And we asked all the super users in each 
uh, neighborhood to put together a walking tour for us of places that they thought would be interesting and to pick a combination of cafes, restaurants, bars, parks, just whatever they thought would give us a good representative mix of what it's like to go out in that neighborhood. Uh, this is me interviewing one of the super users in the same coffee shop. And along the way, we also took screenshots of the app. So what we could do then is we could say, like, this is the experience of actually being there. And then we could say, this is what our product is saying about being there. Like, does it line up? Does it feel right? Is there anything that's missing? Is there any information that Turkish people need when they're going out in Turkey that we're not providing in our service? And what I did is I created a lot of these sort of like really visual slide decks. And at the end of every day, I created um, like one report per field study and I sent it to everyone involved back home. So you can't bring your whole team with you, but you can send them pictures. And especially if they're like vacation photos where it's like you hanging out in Turkey, people are a lot more likely to open that slide deck. And so I just created um, these like really, really photo-centric deliverables that had like one insight per slide. So it just said, you know, when we were here, this is what this super user said, or this is what we learned. This is what's happening with our competitor. And so people could page through it really quickly and it felt really digestible. And it helped people get a sense of what it actually felt like to be in Istanbul with us, which was really what I was trying to do with this particular project, was to create empathy in the United States for what it feels like for users in Turkey. This is us uh, walking down a street in Kadıköy. This is, um, I don't know, maybe 50 riot police. They were going to go shut down a protest. And I actually positioned my, my coworker in front of me and I was like, smile, and I took a picture of his shoulder so I wouldn't get arrested for taking pictures of the police. So I was like, getting put in a Turkish prison is not how I want this project to go. Um, but I thought that this was really important to send back home because we were actually in Turkey in a pretty peaceful time. We were there after the Gezi Park protests and before the recent attempted coup. Uh, but there was still this underlying tension. There was a sense that everything was not quite normal. And you could notice that when you're walking down the street and, and this walks by, right? And when you're building products, you're never building products um, in isolation. Like, there's always this messy cultural context. There's everything that's going on politically, culturally, technology's changing, people are changing. And if you're not aware of all of that, then you can be caught off guard when um, something changes in the future. So I wanted people back home to understand that like, we were understanding the landscape at a moment in time, but the moment in time was really fragile and that things could change in one of many different directions. But they had to understand that like, you know, Foursquare and Swarm are apps on a phone, that people are using those phones in the real world. This is us at a Turkish restaurant. Um, they were so excited that we came there from Foursquare and brought us tons of free food. It was delicious. Uh, we were sitting out on the street. Um, like I said, great trip, highly recommended. <laughs> and this is uh, my product manager, Nick, interviewing Ghoul, who's one of our super users in the fanciest Starbucks in Istanbul. Istanbul's really into Starbucks. And you know, he's sitting there with his pen. He's like really listening hard. And he was such a great partner for me on this trip because he and I could trade off moderating and taking notes. Um, we could take pictures. We could keep track of where we were. He could help me navigate. It was so important to have a partner on the ground. But involving him in moderating also gave him ownership over the findings in a way that you don't really get if you don't involve your stakeholders in actually conducting some of the research. And as, as a researcher, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to say, like, here, you ask some of the questions. Because um, I know that Nick doesn't have the training that I have in terms of asking questions in a way that's not leading. Uh, but there's ways that you can uh, figure out which parts of the interview guide you want to tackle and which parts you want to hand over so that they can feel like they're involved without you know, coloring the data so much by like, you know, just having it be a free-for-all. So set the guidelines up front like I told him what I expected and what I was hoping to get from the interviews, and we set some rules for when we'd hand over, and then he could actually talk to Ghoul himself and, and see how she was using Swarm, and that was really, really important for going back home and having him be an advocate for the research, too. And we also involved the super users in conducting the research. So this is one of the super users, Barishkan, interviewing the venue manager of this Turkish restaurant. And that was so important because Nick and I don't speak Turkish. Not everyone we met in Turkey spoke um, 
good English. So all of our super users spoke good English. I had screened for that. And that was a trade-off that I made where I was like, ah, this is maybe limiting the people I can talk to on this trip. But I felt it was so important for us to actually be able to hop from cafe to bar to park in order to understand how it was used. And I didn't want to add a translator where it was going to be that much harder to get a seat at a restaurant, or it was going to be that much harder to fit into like a crowded bar that was really popular, where a lot of people were going out after work. So I only talked to the super users who spoke pretty good English. And that was actually, it turned out, not very hard to find. Uh, they're communicating all the time with a US-based company. So that sort of self-selects for people who are really, really involved with the product and also spoke pretty good English. But these venue managers we met with didn't speak English. So by having super users along with us, we could involve them in the research too. We could make them feel like they were owning the findings and that they were also part of this overall journey of helping us understand what was going on in Turkey. So through doing the field studies, we learned a couple of really important things. Um, not so much about the product, but more in terms of the overall business and uh, how we related to our communities in other countries. So we didn't have an office on the ground in Istanbul at the time. We had uh, people, like I said, who are going over there periodically to meet with um, maybe clients or vendors. And then while they were there, they'd do a few things. But we didn't have anyone dedicated to understanding what the experience was like. And we learned that we really needed something like that. We learned that there was like a hole for community management where they had, there was a time difference to talk to headquarters. And they were like talking to people who didn't really understand what was going on on the ground. So it was great to go there for a week and to do this research project and to really understand it from that perspective. But we were sort of missing that on an ongoing basis. And we also learned that we needed to build in more feedback loops so that when people put the work into understanding, um, like, when is this venue open? Like, is it closed on holidays? Like, is this address right? This is, there's a lot of like tedious work that goes into having a restaurant and bar discovery app that people don't think about. When people put that time in, they need more rewards for that effort. So we needed to like make their work more visible in the community. So all of this behind me, we flew back to San Francisco. I went home with boatloads of research data to manage. I was like, oh, you know, what am I going to do with all this stuff we learned? And I worked on some deliverables and reported that out. But that's the topic for another talk. So um, just related to conducting this study, I hope that if you're a researcher yourself, you've learned a few things about how to combine your methods so that what you've learned from one method can inform the interview questions for your next method. And how you can sort of stagger the planning so you can use a method like a survey in your downtime when you have a spare hour or two. Um, and then you have methods that are less flexible, like interviews or field studies, where you have to be on the ground. And those are the things you need to plan around, because those are a little bit more fixed in time. But then I hope, whether you're a researcher or not, that you remember to find the right people to listen to and listen completely. Because this is going to make your conversation so much more rewarding and interesting. I've been working on this for 10 years professionally and my whole life, if you include the times I was living abroad and trying to understand what was going on around me. And it's still something I work on every day. I'm not perfect at this. I make mistakes. I think I'll be working on this for my whole life. But just being aware of this and bringing this into how I talk to people and how I have conversations has made them so much more rewarding for me. So I think. Um, I would love for you to try, maybe within the next week, to find a way to incorporate this into a personal conversation or a work conversation. It can be either. And just try to really make sure that you're listening to the right person and that when you are, you're just listening to them completely. You don't have to do this in every conversation because it's very exhausting, but try to do it deliberately with at least one conversation that you have this week. Thanks so much. I'm always scared of dropping the microphone. Bear with this. Ooh. And there's, no. There's water there. I'm not doing that. Oh. Back. OK, so there's a couple of questions. Um, you've described parachuting into an unknown environment with no contacts and doing research. Did you worry about not getting any results, and how did you manage that? And that's from Tim Dobson. I think I was partnering with enough local people on the ground between UTR lab and the super users I was meeting with that I knew I'd get something back. 
Like they were gonna help me structure the interview in a way that I wasn't gonna just totally fall flat. I actually got feedback on the interview guide ahead of time where uh, the agency we were working with gave me feedback that some of the questions that I wanted to ask were really rude to ask in Turkey. And they said like, oh, like you just really can't ask that, like people are gonna shut down. You know, so getting that feedback, we worked together to change the interview guide, and that all happened before I even got on the ground, so they saved me from myself. Right. Good stuff. Um, bear with me. From Tom Hiskey. Did you have to pay or reward users to take part in the field studies, or did they volunteer? Yeah, we talked about that, actually, and it's always something important to think about. We definitely paid people to participate in the lab sessions because they were more casual users. But we decided that with the, the field studies, we would um, bring people t-shirts. So we asked for their t-shirt size ahead of time and gave them a t-shirt. We obviously paid for all the food and drinks along the way. So it was two or three hours where we were like, basically like restaurant hopping. And we were paying for all the food. But we didn't give them an extra incentive on top of that because we didn't want them to feel like we were only listening to them because we were paying them. We didn't want it to feel transactional because they were such a core part of our community. So you're just gonna need to feel it out in different contexts and see what feels right. But in this case, just being there and listening to them was reward enough. There is a question from Gemma Kania, sorry. Um, she's asked, do you have any top tips on how to encourage our business to invest more in user research? And I think that probably just needs a little bit more context. So if you're willing to answer that outside of the Q&A, and we can give you some more context from Gemma's question. Sure, yeah. So if Gemma, if you kind of catch um, catch that question outside of the, the session, that'd be great. You currently work at Lyft. Mm -hmm. Have you faced any different challenges at Lyft than you have at any of the other companies that you've worked at? Definitely. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, I change jobs is because I want to work on different research questions and I want to work in a different space. So I'd been working on social tech for about eight years and I was really excited to work at Lyft to um, get some experience on a product that wasn't social. It's transactional, you know, people are taking rides and paying for them. It's a ride sharing company for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, I know that it's US based, so not everyone here probably has heard of it. Um, but yeah, I think Working in-house as a researcher, you don't get the constant variety you get at an agency. So if you want that variety, working for a different company gives you different problems to, look, to work on. And similar to the question that I asked Boone earlier this morning, you've worked at various different companies. Is there anything that you haven't worked on yet that you would like to and why? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I'm a climate activist in my free time. And I am very passionate about climate change, and I am also interested in how we can connect climate change and the tech industry more together, because so many of our products use energy, and we're sort of blind to that layer underneath. We're blind to where that energy comes from and how we can be more thoughtful about it. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities there that would be really interesting to explore in the future for how we can um, be more thoughtful about climate in have the you, tech industry. Have you got any sp small specifics? of that that you would think about working in or? Well, I'm, I'm happy at Lyft now, so I'm not looking right now. <laughs> but if anyone wants to work on a climate change side project that's UX related and you need a researcher, hit me up. Thank you very much, Craig. <laughs> Cheers, thanks Thank you.